Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 212 for Tuesday, May 21, 21, 2019. Man, a lot of twos and ones. Gig Gab, go! folks and welcome to gig gab the podcast by for and about working musicians here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here in los gatos california it's paul kent yeah man lots of twos and ones today but it's you know, binary it's uh yeah, sure. almost binary. Oh, yeah 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 no, ones and zeros that's right yeah 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 it's it's different binary it's it's new it's the binary of the new math yeah. there you go yeah you're such a nerd i know <laughs> You really wear you really wear that proudly. Uh, yeah, it's who I am. It's totally fine. I'm a music nerd. I'm a computer nerd. I'm just a nerd. Yeah, it's totally fine. Yep. You do you. I I am happy enough. It, I might as well, right? Because doing somebody else, like it's it's very difficult to pretend you're someone else. So you know. unless you're in a cover band or a tribute band, you know. I, actually, I saw a uh, that that Rush tribute band again, Lotus Land. On Saturday night, my son and I were, the girls were away this weekend and, and Lotus Land was playing. So we, we went out and saw them at this theater, it, man, they, it's, it, I've seen them a couple of times now and, uh, that's hard material to play. And every other time I've seen them, they've been very sort of focused on, you know, just making it through the songs, basically doing a good job at it. But, but the other night they were relaxed on stage. They were having fun. They, they reminded me more of Rush on stage than I've ever seen a cover band playing Rush songs or a tribute band in this case. Playing what type songs. of venue? Um, we have a couple of these around here. It's a it, it's called the Blue Ocean Music Hall. It's a it, it's a, 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 a kind of a function hall with multiple tiers of, you know, height tiers of levels. And there's just tables everywhere, like six person tables. You buy your seats at the table and there's a big stage with a big sound system and they serve food. It's not the greatest food, but it doesn't have to be. You know, it's just sustenance and bar. It's bar food, essentially. How big a place? Uh, we figured that it holds about 500 people. So, um, you know, and at 25 bucks a ticket, there's there's good money on the table. Yeah. 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 My we were talking about it. actually the people at the table, uh, the, the guy that was there as a. Uh, he books bands in, in Manchester. And so we're talking about it and he's like, Oh, if the club's smart for this one, they know it's going to sell out. Don't give the band a cut of the door, just pay their fee, whatever it is. And then, you know, mm. you're making your upside. And I was like, Oh, it's interesting to hear the other side of that, you know, but, sure. um, but yeah, man, they played really well. They got the, the sound was, it's by the halfway through the first set, the sound was spectacular. They, they, it's, it's always difficult, you know, doing sound in a room where there's going to be 500 people, Right. And and for soundtrack, you don't know what, you know, it's going to sound. you know, it's going to sound different. And there yeah. just wasn't enough guitar or bass. It was like barely there. So you could hear the parts, but it's like, no, I want to hear you play them. I don't just want to have to make them up in my head because I know them. You know, I know what they're supposed to be uh, and I can see your fingers. And yeah, about halfway through the first set, they got the sound dialed in and it was it was glorious. Really, really good. Yeah. And they, fun they were on it. They were on it. They, they, I, I will say this. I saw them make more mistakes than I've ever noticed before, but really I'm talking like three or four. How many times have you seen them? Uh, I think this is my third time seeing them, uh, but they were, they were more relaxed. They were having fun. And I don't think the mistakes were because of that. I, I think the mistakes were just things that happen, but you know, it, when, when you make a mistake, the, the most important thing is just getting back on track and with that kind of music where really it's three at times and, and generally when the mistakes happen, it's it's these times where it, it, it's these instrumental sections where you've essentially got three different lines that lock in together. Right. You know, the, these rush tunes aren't just like, let's all play the same riff. It's like, let's all play variations on the same riff and then we'll come out the other end together. And that's where they would have these these mistakes. And mm. they, you know. That's where that's a dangerous place to have it, because if you're playing your line, you're, you know, at some level relying on the other guy playing his line right so that you know where to fit yours in and and vice versa. Right. And uh, they did a great I mean, like 
it was not a problem. Anytime there was a mistake, they just stayed right on right on track. And I just think there was one part where they dropped a they one guy dropped a beat and they realized, OK, he's not going to realize it fast enough. So let's just join him. He's right. You know, and that it was that it was sort of a master class, if you will, in the exercise of who who is who is the right one? You know, doesn't need to be the person that's actually right. It just needs to be the one we all agree on immediately. And, and you know, that gets you through the tune. And they, but they sounded great, man. It was so much fun. And they play these songs so fast. I, I mean, not too fast, but Rush has slowed them. Well, Rush doesn't play anymore, but they had slowed <laughs> down a lot of their tunes live intentionally. Um, and, you know, I told you we've been playing Red Barchetta and Fling and messing around with it. And your tempo if tempo gets away from you like it's a disaster because these parts are not easy and there's no reason to play them faster than they need to be uh but these guys were comfortable and able to do it and they were playing them at like album tempos which is pretty impressive for rush tunes so it was fun you know i'm i'm really interested in this because you're talking through this and i it is, it is apparent to me that your scene is is different than mine and it's true it is. And actually you've spent enough time with me and around here and, you know, we've talked enough, but I don't know, like I've done, I've done my couple of Bruce and a couple of petty tribute nights. Right. There are certainly tribute bands, but you know, their main gigs are the summer festivals, but, but through the winter, the opportunity, like, I don't think if someone here, like, like Nick's going to do a, um, a Zappa tribute. Yep. So he's all in for that. And sure. I guess it's a, it's a milestone birthday. I think maybe, maybe zap his 80th birthday next year or something like that. And uh, Nick is putting together a band. He actually has a couple of contacts with a few people who are alum alumni of Zappa's group who he's trying to get involved. And he's going to do this, this event. Now I sold 200 tickets to each of my, no, no, 150 tickets to each of my spring scene things. I'd say 60 to 70% were people who knew me. Yep. And wanted to see what I was doing. And but only about, let's just say 30% were were people who heard there was a Springsteen and they were a Springsteen fan. So for a tribute. I just actually really wonder what the state of my local live music scene here is in the San Francisco Bay Area. There's there's I'm not too clued into the original you know, scene. And so I don't really know how that goes, but I do know all the cover venues. I do know all the clubs and, you know, I know the summer festival series and all that stuff pretty well and see where that's going. And I, I, I wonder about the evolving state of a scene, you know, yeah. uh, I think mine has changed quite a bit. I mean, some of the really long time, well-established, great fan base, consistently quality music um, bands, have retired, tapped out, aged out. Um, and there's a, there's like a new wave that happens every couple of years. You see a new wave. Um, and I can tell this from a lot of the festival series that we're on the bills for. I don't know a lot of the bands that are there. Some of the bands that are there, I do know. And I, my band would never, we were not ready. When we were at that stage of, of, uh, of polish, we wouldn't even have been considered you know, for some of the festivals, but it seems like, it seems like that live music scene is just kind of, it's, it's, it's weird. Again, it's, you know, they're playing largely music from 40 years ago, right? You're playing eighties yeah, and nineties, yeah, sure. seventies and eighties. Um, uh, you know, the music, live music consumers. I don't know if that's an expanding group, you know, certainly not, Millennials, you know, people who are under 40, how long this music has relevance and, you know, connection to them is an interesting thing. And then if you're over 40, you know, you have all, you know, how long are you wanting to go out, you know, spend money wherever, when you go out. And it, I, I just have been, I, there was a, there was a first festival of the season that was here uh, this past weekend. And a lot of my friends were playing there. And then some people who I didn't know were playing there. And, um, my observation was that there are bands who just aren't ready to have that level of, of exposure, but a lot of them are, you know, hobby bands where the guy who leads the band knows someone or sure. has done the networking work and got his band onto a bill and we'll worry about the quality. We'll have a great time and you know, that type of thing. But it just really feels to me like my scene here, you know, I don't know that there would, 
there is a Rush cover band uh, called R50, um, and they're great players. I don't know how often they can purvey their their art. I don't even know how much further outside the Bay Area they can go to to do that. So there okay, is, well let's let's unpack this a little bit here, right? Because I I think uh, scenes evolve for sure, but. It, it sounds like like it, it, let's start with the tribute band thing, right? The venue that I was at this this Blue Ocean Music Hall. There's a few of these around around here, um, and and there's there's enough of them sort of peppered throughout New England uh, that that it's a it's definitely a thing. In fact, I'm I think I'm going to one with your guitar player Simon on on Saturday night. This oh, I heard called, about that. This place called Tupelo, right? Which is a, it almost exactly you know it's a clone of uh, I mean they, essentially they're the same venue, right? You know they're about an hour apart. And so did, wait, let me just ask a question: Are these they're not bars? They're they're music halls. Do they regularly have shows there? And what's the distinction between them and a bar? I mean, what what, what are these entities? Yeah, so that right, it's it's as I described, right? It's this it's table seating. Um, I didn't see any shows that weren't um, standard configuration, meaning like it, it you you could foreseeably like remove the tables and have you know a general admission standing room kind of thing. Uh, it didn't look to me like like this place does this or that Tupelo does this. But um, but looking at the bill every night, you know, every weekend night, they've got some act in there. And usually it's a tribute act. Um, it could also be, you know, like a C level, maybe somebody on the decline of their career or someone, you know, playing a, a sing a solo act doing acoustic stuff from, you know, from their band that was big, you know, 30 years ago or whatever. Got but it. it's it's those types of, of things in there, but things where you can realistically sell 500 tickets. And around here, I mean, that show was sold out the other night. It, it was. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it always is. Right. You know, they you can reliably get, you know, 400 plus for for that band. But that band doesn't play more than maybe 10 gigs a year. Right. And um, 10 I, gigs a year all in New England. Um, generally in the Northeast. Yeah, they'll play. I think they've got one coming up at Daryl's house, which is technically not New England. It's about 10 miles outside of the New England borders. <laughs> you know, they've played like down in Philly, which is Northeast, but not New England. But they've also played gigs at like the Whiskey A Go Go, right? Like they've done things. They've gone to Canada and played for Rush festivals. That's a little different, obviously. Uh, but but, you know, they've they've been working over the years to sort of build themselves up without uh, the need I think, or desire to ha to play, you know, three nights a week doing this stuff or whatever. And I think they get like, you know, seven, eight grand for a, for a show. Right. I think that's their fee. At least that's what the guy that was sitting with us said their fee was. Um, and there's quite a few bands like this. Like there's an ACDC one coming up. There's a Zeppelin one coming up. There's an, there's actually two Eagles tribute bands around here. So they're, and they all play these, these caliber, these size places, these 500, maybe thousand seat venues, but, but generally, you know, let sub thousand, but, but certainly not 200. Right. Um, and then you've got like the, the guys in pink talking fish that, that that's a, a, a mixed tribute act, but they always do their shows GA because of the type of music that they play. They, you know, people are going to want to dance and, and whatever. So, but, but they're, they're sort of the outlier on the, on the, you know, they're, they're a non-traditional tribute band. I would say most yeah. of these tribute bands are playing in places where people want to sit and hear this music played. Uh, you know, for Rush, that makes that's fine. Right. You know, people aren't up and dancing to Rush generally. So that works out. OK. But I, like, I don't know, I, I, like is ACDC that way, too? I mean, it is it is concert style, seated concert style, just in a smaller venue is really probably for cover music for tribute music. Right. So right. you're going to hear, you know, one band. A, there's a yes tribute that that's actually up and coming in this area. Um, but the, so that's one and that's a, definitely a thing here in our scene. But then there's, you know, the venues that can have just like I'll say cover bands or or live bands. I don't want to say I don't want to pigeonhole cover bands into them. Venues that are, you know, in the, you know, one to three hundred person capacity, um, typically a bar serves some food, but but, you know, isn't five hundred people. And uh, and that's where your cover bands play. But it's also where your original bands play. It's also where your acoustic acts play. And mm. here I'm seeing more and more of the rock bands 
are original bands. Uh, there's less and less cover bands going out there and playing music. It's more and more original. And, and th that scene is definitely the one that's for a, for a full band. That's what's growing. And starting maybe five, six years ago, the acoustic thing is where all the cover music is um, in this area. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing. There certainly are cover bands that are good bands that are playing like club gigs, but, but less and less opportunities for them to do that. Uh, and, and, and I think because there's less and less interest in going out to see that, you know, people like acoustic music because it's quieter. You can have your drink and your conversation. I've always said alcohol is the, the worst drug to go and see <laughs> music. It's the worst kind of audience to have because they just want to, people just want to talk with each other. It makes you louder. Yeah. 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 I, I, I won't call it any names, but there were some people sitting near us that that you know there's food right and there's drinks and they had like four margaritas each it was this couple sitting near us and and when the band started they were chitty chatty but mm. about 30 minutes before the band started they each ate a little you know edible chocolate thing with with THC in it and about 30 minutes after the band started their conversation stopped they were blissful <laughs> to be next to so it was great right it was like i ah, if only you had taken eaten those maybe you know a half hour before everything would have been even better but it was fine so um so i think i, I think for you know the acoustic thing i think that makes sense right because people can chit chat and kind of do what they want to do um a tribute band you're going to hear this music that you in theory love right and and so that's like you go to hear a specific thing um and the same is true with original music like you're going you're either going to support your friend or you're going to see a band whose music you like right because they're the only band that's going to play that for you or yeah in theory so um and i've definitely seen that evolution happen here without question so you 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 have this Slightly different. It's different. You have, yeah, but you have more. Way. You have more listening venues, more like like concert venues yeah. than I think that we do, right? So yeah, but you guys have all those wineries, right? I mean, I that which we do not have, and and you have more of the. We have some of these, but the outdoor, uh, you know, on the green in the summer time. Well, you have of nine venues. months of of outdoor weather, exactly. you know, Essentially, we right? get three. Yeah, if we're right. lucky, and it rains. Yeah, yeah. It's also our rainy season, right? So you do, yeah. you're right. We do have that, and those venues are like that. Yeah. I I was reflecting more on this concept that as my scene has changed, you know. So so if we, again, unpacking it. So yeah. you have you have the pro musician who makes derives his living from playing music. You have the semi-pro weekend warrior. Then you have the, you know, the pure hobbyist. Right? right. And my observation was more that the, that the, it's hard for that pro level to sustain life purely as a performing musician. Most of the ones I know have to supplement with, uh, with teaching. Right. Yeah. Teaching and, and theater work is, is where a, well, a lot go. of that goes here. Yep. For sure. Yeah. But my observation was that, you know, there were, in this next generation, the hobbyist, the guy who wants to get back into it, and because he's probably, you know, has some business chops, can get him his way talked into gigs. Right. Even right. if his band is is not ready. Now, the, the, there are also some great, you know, I don't want to just diss my scene entirely. There's a new group that's kind of coming up through the ranks here called Given to Fly that I'm totally in three piece group. The leader plays guitar and keyboards and sings like a freaking bird they're really wonderful i mean i would go out of my way to see them they're just really really good um we have a band called hoot nanny here that uh, again three-piece acoustic format they um they they tackle really really difficult uh, the best variety of music in the area i mean they, they'll do bohemian rhapsody as a three-piece acoustic group right and yep. And, uh, yep. and just really interesting and good but i'm also seeing a lot of guys where it's like Hey, let's get a little blues band together. And, you know, it's, it's 26 minutes of guitar solos in between a, another verse. And it's, I don't, I, and, but not it, 27, never 27, right? No, well, that, that'd be too long. I mean, come on. That's right. Come on. Come be, on. be real. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, and I, I think at the end of the day, you step far enough away from the, from the problem. Is that the death of a scene when the quality of the music out there starts to get, you know, not, and I say this with not just a little bitterness. I, 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 as I was thinking about this, my band busts its butt 
And we almost kill each other, sweating the details, arguing you know, about stuff. Of course. And I think about the blood, sweat and tears that goes into getting my band, you know, on stage, much less successful, but just just getting us to agree enough on quality that we can, you know, take the stage. And then some guy comes on and, you know, plays mediocre Stevie Ray Vaughan and away and they, it goes. They are seen as the same. They are seen as. Equals. And that's the killing part. Actually, that's that's where this whole conversation comes from. Dave, yeah, is I get that. I was reflecting on that. And it's so dejecting. And I, and I talked to Simon about this for quite a while. He was like, dude, you just got to do you, you know, have your standards play 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 music as it what it means to you and let the chips fall where they may you know you'd like to believe that qualitatively yeah you know you're you're going to get the calls for the really cool gigs and the really fancy gigs but when it but comes to a scene not. yeah i mean you're not necessarily <laughs> well it, like to your point like and and this is a this is an important thing i, I don't want to gloss over this um you need to have someone who is good at selling to sell your band, to book your band, right? And if you don't, it almost doesn't matter. I mean, I'm sure we can find exceptions to this rule I'm about to lay down, but it just doesn't matter how great your band is if it's not being sold well, right? Because you're it, the flip side is a band that's not, you know, all that great with a great salesperson, manager, whatever you want to call that, that role is going to get tons of work. And you need to have that in every band and in your band, it's you. Right. And and clearly you are good at this. Uh, you know, 20 years of history. There's nobody's going to argue with that. You are also someone who prioritizes putting a quality show on the stage that probably right. helps you in in your sales pitch. Like if, if you're selling anything, you have to believe in it. And it's way easier to believe in something if it's actually good quality as opposed to, <laughs> you know, well, you know, like it doesn't have to be, but it is for you. Certainly that is the case. And, and that's great. Right. But that is it not the case. Anyway, it's not the case for every salesperson. Right. Yes. And, and it I, like the most important lesson I hope people take away from this is you need to have someone that is in charge of and taking the lead on and taking the reins of booking your band. Because if you don't have that bookings are not a priority to you. I know there's somebody out there saying, no, no, we don't have that, but bookings are a priority. They are not because you mm -hmm. haven't made them one. You need to like, you have someone that's good at playing the drums, right? And that's your drummer. Same is true for your guitar player. Same is true for your bass player. So you've prioritized having instrumentalists. That's awesome. You probably prioritized having singers. Great. You've hopefully prioritized having songs that you play and play well. Awesome. If you don't have someone that is good at and actively doing the booking, you have not prioritized the booking. And if you want bookings, you need to do that. Right. It's just yeah. a it's just a fact of it. And, you know, I've seen bands where, you know, you go and you see them all present company excluded, of course. And, and I've never been in a band like this, but uh, you go see a band and you're like, all right, well, there's five guys on stage, whatever, you know, six, let's say six guys on stage. Uh, and you're like, wow, five of them can really play. And one of them is mediocre. And it's like, I guarantee you that's the booking guy. <laughs> and, and often more often than not, it is right. And it's like, okay, that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a smart band, right? They, you know, there, there's not enough money on the table to pay a booking guy who doesn't also get to go out and play, right? It's a labor of love for everybody involved. It's okay. But and I've seen bands fall apart when somebody says, oh, you know, we got to get rid of that guy. He just doesn't play all that well. It's like, well, that's not actually the only reason he's here. And it's all OK. Like we all do everything. It's good. So, yeah. Yep. I don't know. So Hopefully anyway, take it, seems change. I, it feels like we're in a we're in a holy war to kind of keep live music vibrant and alive in every everybody's individual scene. I mean, I watch, I really enjoy those Facebook threads on, on cover band central that, you know, they get, they get a little testy sometimes, but I mean, you know, it's, it, you see that there's a community of human beings out there that just really are passionate about art, their art and, you know, doing something cool and, you know, playing music with people. And, it, and that's really, that's really stimulating when you sense your scene is at a wavering point. And maybe it's, maybe it's a pendulum situation, right? Maybe sure. it goes both ways, right? Maybe it swings back and a bunch of real great players. It's fun to be in a vibrant scene. It's, yeah. it's, it pushes you to be better. It makes, makes the music, it makes 
everything about it. it makes the venues better it, it makes the people coming out more excited to see live music more. And not that they're not excited but you know again no, like you said theme. they don't discern they don't so yeah. many people don't discern between well rehearsed and unrehearsed they just know wow all my friends are here this is the scene to be today and and you know that's the social part of it often takes takes a precedence in a scene I'd like the music and the art and the quality because it just it makes me want to play better and it makes me want to book better and, you know, makes me want to sound better. And that that's well, fun. I, I think I think you're I think both of those things have to be true. And what I'm saying when I mean by that is the social part is always going to be the most important part of the scene. If you happen to be in a scene where the social part is about good bands and going out to see good music. That's when it really, that's what you're talking about here is like people that bond together over going to see a band because it's a good band. And then saying, Oh, have you seen this other band? They're really, you got to go see them too. Like when the social scene can be less about, Hey, it's a party. Like, I don't care what band's playing. I just want to go and like, whatever, you know, have a drink with my friends or dance or like whatever it is. That's different from I want to go see a good band because my friends want to go see a good band. Right. Like yeah. and when I was growing up, that was definitely the scene. Like when I was in high school and college in Connecticut, like especially you know where we were in, in southern Connecticut, but even like throughout the rest of the state, you know, a, there was an original music scene. And that was true here in Portsmouth, too. I think actually around the same time. Um, where it, you know, people would go and, and you would talk about, oh, I like that band and this band and you've got to go see these guys. And that was the scene. It was the social part was about the music um, yeah. as much as it, and it wasn't only that it was because I want to go have a good time with my friends and have a drink and like all that stuff. That's fine. But, but there was a component that was definitely that. Um, and I'm starting to see that happening again here with like the very beginnings of it with original music. Um, it like, it's starting to get that. There's like buzz that happens like, Oh, you like that band? Oh, you should check these guys out. It's like, Oh, that's like that conversation didn't happen 10 years ago here. That's interesting to me. So yeah. Yeah. But I don't think scenes die. Uh, you, you mentioned the death of a scene it might be the death of this version of the scene, but there, mm -hmm. the reality is uh, we're, we as musicians and, and, you know, speaking from, for all of us, we're always going to want to play. Right. And we're always going to find avenues to play. We're always going to find places. We're probably going to take gigs for less money than we should sometimes because we just want to play. Like all of those things will always be true. Uh, as long as there are people playing instruments, right. And writing songs and, and that sort of thing. So, I, like, I think I think scenes will wax and wane, but I don't think they just die and, and, and wax and wane. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Well, so on a related topic, we, here's an interesting thing. Well, so, wait, wait, wait. I, I, we have two questions from listeners and then I want to jump to this related topic. If that's if that's the if that's where the topic I think I'm we sure. Were going yeah. To. yeah. OK, yep, yep, yep. cool. Um, in the last episode, because these two things are really important, uh, especially this first one in the last episode, we were talking about gear and ensuring your gear. And we asked for your help. And Dan, you delivered. Dan wrote and says, I use Music Pro insurance. And we've got a link, of course. And I've been happy with the cost side of it and how easy it is to buy. Um, I can also share my experience making a claim with them. People always wonder how hard insurance companies work to avoid playing on, paying on claims. He says, short version, it was a total piece of cake. And I couldn't be happier with how it went. I'll talk about his claim in a minute, but I want to talk about the insurance first. He says, when you sign up, you enter your gear and its retail prices on their website. They ask for serial numbers if you have them. And he says, as a pro tip, Sweetwater, if you bought your stuff there, lists your product serial numbers in with your order history, which is pretty good. Uh, he says, a couple times since, uh, since then, I've added or removed things from my list right there on the Music Pro website. After you submit your gear, you get an email an hour or so later, later saying it's been approved. He says, so I guess there's somebody sanity checking your pricing. He says, but I've never had to provide documentation of anything, which is really handy because, uh, it, you know, often we buy things new, but 
just as often, I think, as musicians, perhaps more as more often, we're buying things used from each other. You know, I've got right. a guitar I don't use anymore. I'll sell it to my friend, you know, Bill or whatever. Or, you, you know, all oh, this. I don't need these speakers. Who wants them? And, you know, those kinds of things happen all the time. And it seems like Music Pro is aware of this and has a system in place to, to make it really easy. He says, uh, I imagine their focus on music gear means they're kind of up to speed on what things should generally cost. He says, all my gear was more or less new or at least had a sales receipt I could have pr produced if necessary, although it wasn't. No idea how they'd handle vintage or unique items where there's a significant collector value. And he says he has his coverage for about uh, $18,000 worth of gear and it costs him 180 bucks a year. So, you know, the, the math is pretty good on that. Yeah. Um, yeah and he said his his uh, claim, which uh, it, it, which is great. He says he broke his iPad, which he has included in his list of covered gear, which is another pro tip here. Uh, he says it's crucial in the uh, you know, it plays a crucial role in the high quality of my entertaining and engaging performances. Uh, he says I use it at gigs. He says, but it wasn't damaged at a gig. It fell off my desk and shattered completely like crumbs of glass. He says, I needed it replaced immediately. So I went straight to the Apple store and did their broken drive, broken device replacement, then submitted a claim on the Music Pro website. He says, a very friendly agent called later that day, asked me to email a picture of my Apple store receipt and had a check in the mail to me the next day for that amount, less the hundred dollar deductible. So I guess his his policy has a hundred dollar deductible. Right. Yeah. So that's I mean. That sounds pretty perfect to me um, as someone who has struggled with this many times over the years, trying to get it listed the right way on my homeowners and all that good stuff. So and that pricing is no different than what I have paid on my homeowners after going yeah. through all the headaches. So that's pretty good. So thank you for that sounds that, great. Man. Yeah, yeah. That's a good tip. No we kidding. Share. No kidding. Yep. And then uh, and then listener Ron, uh, who is a, a fellow percussionist, fellow singing drummer. He says, I'm in the market for it. So this is gear and, and we love gear here. He says, I'm in the market for a new vocal mic with good off axis rejection for behind the kit as I'm singing a leads more and more. He says, uh, a while back, you guys talked about your favorites and I definitely want to try them, but I can't find it. So what is it? And um, so I use a, a microphone from a company called Heil. It's uh, they, they well, it's a, it, they make some great mics there. They they started in the amateur radio business, believe it or not. Uh, Joe Walsh is actually Bob Heil's partner. They're both ham radio buds. But um, and 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 then because of partially because of Joe, they they started you know figuring out mics for uh, for uh, stage use as well. In fact, I'm talking on a Heil PR40 here in the studio. But I use a PR30 live now. It's a it's a weird shaped mic, uh, but it works fine for me live. It was originally designed as an instrument mic, but I, I think it was Joan Baez, if I'm remembering the story correctly, who decided to start using the PR30 as a vocal mic. And because of that, Bob Heil started making two more versions of it. The PR35, which is a handheld version that looks like a classic handheld vocal mic. And the PR31BW, named after Bob Workman, who is Charlie Daniels' sound engineer, who wanted a shorter version of the PR30 for miking drums, but also tends to work well if you've got if you're a singing drummer and you want to have it on like a boom stand or something, so it's not in the way. Uh, they all have fantastic off-axis rejection, really stellar gain, and a pattern that makes it. I guess the best way to describe it for me is it makes me feel like I'm singing into a condenser mic. But I'm not. I'm singing into a dynamic and it picks up what I want. I can sort of move closer or further away and get that mic effect exactly as I want it without it feeling unnatural. But it doesn't pick up. I mean, it picks up some of my drums, but the, the, the rejection is really good. Uh, the other one that I would recommend is a Telefunken M80. Uh, that's that's sort of the, the you know, the, the competitor to the, the PR35. What's They're the both, price range of these? About 250. Um, Got it. Yep. And uh and another great mic. I don't I've, I've sung into the M80 series mics. They sound fine. Uh, they're a little weird if you're not right on them, like like lined up right on them straight in front of it. It like it, it, it it's a little weird. It almost feels to me like the element is at the end of the mic, like the other end of the mic. And you have to sing down the tube straight at it. Wow. It's not it's not there. It's at the it's at the correct end. But that's what it feels like to me. But you do get that good off axis rejection and, and tons of people are using the M80s. Most 
most touring bands these days are either using the M80 or the PR35, but I think the M80 is a little more power, more, um, more popular, but, but I, you're not going to go wrong with either one of them. Uh, it, it's more personal preference. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Cool. What do you use? Beta fi- everybody, beta 58. Beta 58. Huh. I've always, Every, the, I've always all, hated the whole those. band uses them. That's great. Uh, it is helpful from a sound engineer's perspective to have this, everybody on the same mic. Uh, yep. Usually, but if you've got somebody whose voice is better on a different mic, then it's better to have them on that different mic for sure. But um, but it's if, not that big a deal to 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 you know personalize the the EQ curves for it. So uh, I agree with that. Yeah, I would. I I uh, I don't know. There's some people like I I I have found too many people, m- me being one of them, who do not sound good on a Beta 58. Um, Ooh. female singers, I don't think sound good on beta 58s in general. It's, there's, it's too thin. Right. And so it, do, it doesn't have any body to it. Um, but you know, I mean, if it, if, if it works for everybody in your band, then that's great. But I, as a, if I was doing sound, I would never select those. They're just not my, I don't know. They're not my scene, but you know, so it's fine. They're, you know, that's the, that's the beauty of it. Yeah, exactly. 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 All right. So uh, hopefully that's good. If you have a question or a tip or if you have an insurance company that you want to tell us about feedback at giggabpodcast.com, we would love to hear from you. Really, we just love to hear from you. And it's mm-hmm. great. We've been getting so much feedback. It's really it, it makes it makes our joy for the podcast last all week long when there's stuff coming in and we get to kind of interact with all you folks. It's, it's awesome. So feedback at giggabpodcast.com. You had something you wanted to mention, Paul. I did. So it's a conversation that rears its head in my band every now and then where someone will say, why do we, we have three clubs that we are regulars at. Okay. Um, you know, that that's part of my strategy is those three dates keep us working through the winter, you know, keep us on stage playing, give us opportunity to try material. I mean, they just keep us in front of our fans. That's part of our our strategy is, and I, I actually would love to have two more, but, um, uh, and then there are several, um, of these outdoor things that we do and invariably every year, someone will say, why do we do that one? Right. Why do we yeah. do that? They yeah. don't treat us that good. Nobody, they don't get very many people out to that one. They stage um, is small. The loading stage sucks. Is small. Yep. Exactly. Right. There, there's a, there's a list of things. And I'm always really cautious with that type of input because I remind guys like, listen, we can find stuff wrong with every gig. If we start whittling gigs, we'll play less. And if we play less, guys will find other things to do with their time. And then the whole house of cards falls in on itself. Right. So that's, that's always been kind of my thing is like build up, you know, a, a, a predictably busy schedule where, where, but there's not a predictably busy schedule of stellar gigs as a cover band. Right. right. You know, th- there's, there's an, uh, especially in the winter time. So uh, that was really my comment about be careful once you achieve some level of consistency, I'm not going to call it success. I'm just going to call it consistency of booking that you start getting too critical of the venues that you would have died to play at when you were not working. Right. This is why you're good at what you do. In, in uh, term, no, 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 no. Because I am, I am the other guy in this scenario. I, I try to be aware of it, but I, I definitely fall into the, I, the trap of becoming too picky. And that's really what we're talking about here, right? Like how picky is too picky? And, and I can nitpick the crap out of anything and make it seem to myself and others because I'm pretty good at convincing people that it's <laughs> awful. And, and it is you know, it's self-defeating, right? <laughs> like we like the gig. It's like, sure. The load in sucks here. Okay, fine. You know, is there, a, is there something we can do to deal with that? Or do we just have to swallow it if we want to play that gig? But it's really easy not to stop and ask yourself that question, right? Like, well, they don't get a lot of people. Okay. Well, is there something we can do to help with that or, or, you know, or not? And do we care, right? Like, it, it, are they okay with it? Are we okay with it? Is it a good paid rehearsal? Like, can you reframe these things in your head to be, you know, glass half full, play glass half full. And, and that's the trick I usually have to play with myself, but I'm, I, I know that I'm bad at it in this scenario because I, I get picky 
and and it can it can be the downfall of of a band, right? If you've got too many people on board with, oh yeah, well that club sucks because of this tiny little thing in that club. Well, there's no way we could play there because you know they've got that extra step. Oh, man, who, who built <laughs> that thing? What moron built that? We can't play there. They're, they're morons. We can't play that club. They're a bunch of morons. You know, and suddenly it just becomes a truth uh, amongst your band anyway that all of these places are are undesirable. And then the poor person who is in charge of booking uh, is like, well, gosh, you know, I don't want to go through the effort of putting because it is effort. It's a lot of effort, you know, booking these dates and pulling it all together just to hear the band complain about it. Even if those complaints are not with the intention of we shouldn't ever play there again. It's just, oh, yeah, just those, it's exhausting. Absolutely. It's just exhausting hearing it. And, yeah. and we've definitely run into that in Fling. I don't, and there've been maybe one or two places over the years where, where a complaint has risen to the level of, and let's not play there. Like explicitly, I don't want to play there again because of X. Most of the time, it's just, oh God, those stairs there or whatever. Like, you know, but, but enough of those comments make it so that the guy who's doing the bookings is like, do I want to call that and have to hear this again? You know, even if they're not consciously thinking about it, subconsciously, yeah. it it devalues it. And you're like, ah, screw it. I won't call them again. That's fine. You know, and then you don't have gigs. So you just have be to careful. be careful. Yeah. When you're a member of a band, you really need to think about when you need to check yourself and, you know, your comments. Yeah. You know, because they they become cancers. Right. And then it's cancer. What often right. happens yeah. is, is, is a guy feels a need to express something. He then you're met with. You know, some amount of aggravation back and then you feel like your worldview has been threatened and then you feel all of a sudden now you really have to defend this thing where you were actually kind of you, you were just kind of griping a little bit but now it's someone's now in your face everybody's entrenched for no right. good reason that's right and that stuff escalates really bad and it, it, like i shared you know one of my core strategies with the house rockers was i have half my band are full-time pro musicians they teach they gig music is their income sure if i don't keep them busy they will find something else to do so Luckily, they bought in to what I was doing and were willing to help build it. And we don't really have any bad gigs now. Like we get paid, you know, we get treated pretty well. You know, we're playing the better of the places that there are to play in my geography. And it's pretty good. But again, every once in a while, someone will say, Ugh, you know, that's a 45 minute drive. And I'm thinking <laughs> of some of the people we've heard from, in, you know, on this, you know, like they'll drive two hours for a gig to make a hundred bucks. You know, some, some, some bands will. Right. Yeah. And you know, that's, uh, that's the thing. Uh, but the, the message here is that it's the leaders. It's the value that the leader adds to kind of keep everybody chill you know, have have what your band's values are with regards to gigs. Remind the band religiously that this is what our values are, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, don't don't book bad gigs, you know, because that's certainly going to turn some people off. But talk to your band about, you know, like, listen, these guys really want us to play. They want us, to, you know, they're going to bring us in. It's, you know, it, they, they offered us a little bit less than our scale the first two times to help them build. But then they said, they'll get it. You know, I, I, I've talked to the owner. I believe this is where is going to be worthwhile. You know, I think we should invest our time here. Right. You know, it, it, it's, it's all about a, a, a good channel of communication where, where the plan, right. Because there's the musical plan, but there's also the business plan and the business plan, keeping everybody on the same page. You know, a lot of musicians are like, tell me where to be, tell me how much you're paying me. And that's the extent of all I need to know. Right. You know, I'm in. Right. But the le the way the leader gets a little bit of leverage in the conversation is, listen, I'm booking you 50, 60, 70, 80 times a year. You know, if, if you're going to sub out a couple of my gigs, I'll find someone who'll take, you know, wants us to be their first call. Do you want to give up 80 gigs a year? Right. Right. And you, that's how a leader gets a little bit of leverage in that conversation is the volume of business that they provide the musicians. Everybody's an individual contractor. Everybody has leverage in these kind of conversations. Uh, one of the ways that a leader gets leverage is, you know, Communicate well, do what you say you're going to do, book good gigs. And if they're less than good gigs, have a have a justification for why you think it's something worth everybody's time. Right. Right. And sometimes that might be listening. You guys want to stay home on a Friday night or you want to play some music that, you know, that that question might work for your band. Right. And you might have guys who say, yeah, all right, I'll do a 50 buck gig. You know, I'm not doing anything this Friday. Sure. You know, let's go out and have a good time. And that's up to your band. If that's your vibe, of your band. Yep. I, you know, I find with a lot of the pro musicians, 
that they value their time. You know, if, they, if their horn is in their hand from 11 in the morning until six at night, and then they go over to a gig, you know, you say 50 bucks for, they may be like, you know, what, I'd, I'd rather have a night with my wife or something like that. Sure. And, you know, you got to understand that. That's where the very clear communication uh, between leader and band, or if it's, if it's a, if it's a democracy, you know, the band, you know, hive brain, you know, what do you all believe? What are your values for how you do things? Yeah. But uh, the point of this is if you're the guy who's going to gripe about a gig, understand what you're setting into motion. If you're a leader and you hear griping, do you have a professional um, way to kind of keep that conversation in line? Can you respectfully hear the griping, yeah. address it in a respectful way, you know, without blowing someone out of the water and, and, uh, and keep everybody focused on the big picture, which is probably keeping your band working in the best environment capacity that you possibly can. Yeah. yeah well, that's the trick, right? Is, but keeping everyone in your band aware of that too, right? Like, I think, I think that's, as much of the the trick as it is anything else right is is you gotta like you gotta make sure everybody knows that before the gripes start because the like ah. you said before the gripes are cancer so it it can even though you all sort of intellectually can state yes this is a bad thing we appreciate what this person you know that's booking us does all of these things it, if, if you can't just shut it down then it doesn't matter that you understand, right? I know he just needs to vent after the gig. Don't worry about it. Well, yeah. that's okay. Uh, you know, once, twice a year, maybe. Right but, right. but if it's happening at the beginning of every rehearsal where like, I guarantee the first gig I played two years ago with, with um, Uptown Celebration was the Boston public library. It was a high paying gig. It was the worst load in and load out that I think any of us had experienced. So it has become a meme amongst the band, you know, that like any load in load out we do anywhere. It's like, well, at least it's not the Boston Public Library. Right. That And it there is no way we would take another gig at the Boston Library. <laughs> like it doesn't matter. It like that. There's Gary wouldn't even consider booking. It. Actually, he probably would. And if he did, he would book us a back line. So even then, like there's there's the the way to spin that positively. Like, sure, we do the gig, but we're not loading our gear in and out. You know, right, right, Look, right. we'll show up and play. But um, but there's there's no world in which Gary could even consider bringing to us the idea of, look, I got us a gig there, but we have to load our gear like I couldn't hire SIR to bring the gear. So it's up to uh, like there's there's because he's been just as much a part of the conversations as we have. Even though it's all just like if, if he did that, we'd all be like, OK, well, we know what we're getting ourselves into. How much money is there? OK, like, yeah, maybe we'll hire another person to come with us or something, you know, like there's a world where that would be totally fine. But yeah. until we have that conversation that spins it the other way, I don't think he would do it like because he's well, a smart and, guy. <laughs> and the, the other thing with a situation like that, a smart leader. Shared crisis brings people together. If you guys exactly. have, a, have a laugh over it yep. and you have a meme over it and, you know, you never say never. Cause remember, you know, you get offered a gig that's 500 a man and Gary says it's a crap load in, but is it worth it for 500 a man? You, you get critical mass of people saying, yeah, it's it would have to gig. be double that. But, but anyway, whatever, just in case whatever is listening. That's right. <laughs> well, you just, but also, you know, if, if you're talking about that type of number money, yeah, go, go hire some hands. Go hire go some hire hands. Some agents. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That's what we usually so, get, though. Like, we're, we're not too far off from that for normal gigs. So like, that would cool. have to be more. No, it's great. Well, that, that's a good conversation we got to have. I've been looking, you know, Russ has been wanting that. He had that in his last band. And yeah. to go from having that to not having that is a pain point for him. Yep. And, uh, but I can't find people to do it. I mean, I can't, I, you know, Craigslist, our Facebook page. I've looked for people who would be reliable, you know, show up. You know, here's the pay. Here's the number of gigs. Yeah, that's a hard, that's a hard thing for me to find. I don't know if there's a different labor market back there, but it's hard for me to find it. Um, I know that being on and having a long history on gig masters is what worked here for Gary with Uptown Celebration. Um, for getting hands, for getting roadies. Oh no, not for getting. Sorry, I thought I thought you meant for getting gigs, like the, no, the no, higher no, no. paying gigs. Oh, sorry. No. Ah, hiring hands, hiring stage hands, no. starring roadies. Yeah, that's tough, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's you, you the only people that I know that that have it are either like touring 
productions that that have enough work that they can actually pay somebody a salary, right? Like a meaningful wage. Yeah. Um, or consistent, reliable, correct. ongoing. Yep. Yeah. Or, you know, a buddy that says, you know, hey, do you want 200 bucks for tonight? And, you know, or whatever it is like, you know, yes. OK, great. But but that's not consistent. Right. It's like, oh, who do we have tonight? Who do we do? we? And, and sometimes the answer is, uh oh, we don't have anybody, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Man, we were all yeah, over the know, place today. If you know how to get roadies, let us know if you've if you've figured out the magic formula. That would be a, a good thing because I know that there's there's a lot of folks that are playing in bands that that could carve off enough to and theoretically pay you know for some some helping hands at the gig. So yeah, it's tough. It's tough even finding a full time sound person. Like you know, you're very lucky to have Bill with Uptown. We are super fortunate to have Dave Albetsky who does our our sound. Um, I mean it like I, yeah. It, because those neither of these bands would exist without someone dedicated to doing sound like it just it, you without have a, to we could it. not do what we do without bill i mean Correct. he is he is you could argue that he's the most important guy in the band I, oh i like i look at dave that way in in uptown because he's the one taking what we do on stage and crafting it together into something that works for the people who hired us like yep. it's hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. That's yeah, crazy. Well, and, you know, as yeah. we're saying this stuff, it, it all goes back to that concept of, you know, we give a crap about quality. We rehearse, yeah. we argue, we sweat the details. We hi- we buy good sound gear. We, we hire sound guys. We try and, you know, do things to make the art as good as possible. And uh, I, I'm just stuck today because again, the, you know, the people who really, your 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 ten thousand hours of perfecting your your craft versus the considerably less than that effort when it goes unnoticed it's really disheartening i mean when it when when it all clicks i, I i'll actually close with this we had a gig a couple months ago where um it was a club date and whatever the reason it was our best grossing club date ever it was awesome and it was a bunch of people who I didn't know. I usually this club, I know half the room. I didn't know a quarter of the room. Oh, this time. that's awesome. And it was a really fulfilling thing. Cause we went over the band played great. The band, you know, it was one of those things where we felt like we won new fans. I mean, and in fact, you know, those, many of those people who said hi after the gig or just, you know, people come by, they say, I really love the band. And then you start to see them in other gigs. That's insanely rewarding. That, oh, yeah. that, that's the other side of this. So for every time where, you know, it doesn't matter when it does matter. You know, that's, that's twice as valuable as the, as the hurt, hard, you know, hurt ass feelings when, when it, it doesn't feel appreciated. So totally. Oh no. I remember I, I've had it, I guess more with original bands than with cover bands, just, just because of whatever ex- path I've taken. But um when when there there are people that no one in the band knows, you know, there's, it's not personal friends of the band and they come up, you know, the second gig, the third gig that they're there. They're like, oh, I hope you guys are playing that song tonight. It's like, Ugh. whoa. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So onward we march in the pursuit of those good people who just want music to heal them and, you know, make them happy and that type of stuff. Yeah, because that's why we do it. Yeah. That's why we do it, Dave. That's exactly right. So I'll get out of my funk now and uh, and, uh, I'll send you your $25 for therapy and we'll be good. (laughs) Is that all it's worth these days? I I thought I thought maybe it was a bro discount. Oh, the bro discount. That's right. That's right. Of course. Yes, that's right. You know what? This one's on the house, man. Thank you, my brother. (laughs) Of course. All right, folks. Feedback at GigGabPodcast.com. We've said it three times, so there's no way you forget. Send us something. Just say hello. And what's the last thing, Paul? Even if they can't tell the difference, always be performing.